get those crowd noises. <laughs> no, not at all. I think Apple's a very innovative company. Um, the comment that I made earlier was that um, the younger generation isn't necessarily looking at computer use the same way that we are looking, our older business type uh, population is looking at, at computer use. So I think as those two uh, generations become more and more relevant, then we're going to start to see some kind of compromise between Apple and, and PC makers where we get a little bit more cross functionality between both platforms. But, you know, I'm glad Apple's here because, you know, they, they drive a lot of innovation that forces PC users to rethink the way that, um, you know, they're developing uh, their their software, the, the way that they're developing the uh, the, the PC too. So, I, I think I, I think the mantra with Apple is "Thou shalt not, thou shalt not do this, <laughs> thou shalt not do that." <laughs> there aren't very many "thou shalt wills" or whatever <laughs> "thou shalts." <laughs> so hopefully that at least uh, clarifies the issue. So I know we, this isn't a show about Apple versus PC. Um, I don't think we we may, maybe we'll have that show in the future. I don't know, but um, you know it was uh, something that that looked like it needed a little bit of clarification from um, some of the comments that were. We're appearing in the chat room. Terrence is a PC and I'm an Apple. <laughs> <laughs> actually, no, I, I actually prefer PC too. We have a couple, we have several Apples, but they're okay. Um, they have their place. Yeah. You know, it's really funny as well because when I first started, um, Apple was the main uh, computer system that I used, primarily because I was involved with graphic design and training people how to use graphic applications. I was uh, teaching users how to uh, to get scripts with Quark Express and Illustrator and Photoshop and uh, then I got into web design and development and teaching that and then it was Photoshop, Dreamweaver and Flash and uh, now I'm a, you know into rapidly learning development and it's Captivate, it's Articulate, it's uh, Photoshop and Flash again so it, it's interesting really to see a way in which uh, a lot of those programs that I started using back in the day, I'm still able to use today. And, you know, I think the programs like Photoshop and Flash have just come on so much over the years. It's amazing. What do you think? Uh, one, one thing I'd love to see is a game engine for e-learning. I are, would love to see that, Rick. I don't know any right now that do that, but that would be so cool. I'm surprised in Flash nobody's really developed one. Um, a, a game engine that you could actually put your characters in there have a, have already pre-programmed interactions. You know, people think a lot of the game a lot of the games are done from scratch. No, they use very sophisticated mm -hmm. engines to generate probably eighty percent of the game, and then they do some specific coding as needed. But these game engines are very very sophisticated, and if we could leverage the power of gaming for e-learning, boy, wouldn't that be fun? And and you'd grab the whole new generation, which isn't really into reading as much, but they're much more into gaming and and work on a PC. I, I think that'd be great. Yeah, definitely. I mean, one of uh, one of my relatives uh, attends a uh, autistic school, and um, in their classes, they've now decided that the best way to teach the uh, the students mathematics, for example, is to let them go through some of the games, etc. Because it's uh, as you know, it's very visual and it's problem solving, etc. And they introduce uh, mathematics to them in that particular way, and then they actually start hitting the more traditional. Um, uh, mathematical style um, uh, teaching sessions, if you like, once they've got the interest there. And again, I think it all comes down to the whole idea of making sure that it's motivational. And gaming is obviously something that's highly motivational. Yeah, that's true. Terence, you've done some work on rapid e-learning. I, I have. Um, and, uh, you know, RJ and Leva and a few of the other other ones out there will be will be happy to know that I've uh, been doing a, a lot more stuff with uh, Captivate. So um, I know in the last couple of episodes, I've talked up uh, some of the other uh, programs like uh, Articulate. And I, I think they, they all have great, great potential. And it really depends on um, what you are using the tool for. And, um, you know, Captivate is, 
it, it, it's it's a great tool, has great op- options, and I think in certain situations it, it may even be more appropriate than Articulate to use, but I can flip those situations around and say Articulate may be uh, the right tool to use. So, you know, I don't know if the debate about which tool is better could ever be answered, but um, I, I think that as a, an e-learning professional, it's important for all of us to have um, – uh, fluency in in the majority, at least of the popular tools, because a, a client, uh, internal or external, may uh, need a, a project done a certain way, and and it may be more efficient or effective to do it with, you know, a particular tool. And one of the worst things you could ever have is a one vendor environment where you have one vendor, one tool, and that's it. Period. Yeah. And there's no competition. Without competition, we get nowhere. That's and that's what's been good for the industry. The more tool vendors we have, the better our tool sets are going to be in the long run. And um, mm-hmm. so I'm, I'm all for competition. You know, yes, use the tools you enjoy and like, but make sure that they have some competition because we all benefit from that. Capitalism yeah, I would totally, I totally agree with that as well. And I think sometimes that, you know, the determination of which product you will use is really determined by what the client has. For example, you know, you may have a particular client who already has Captivate. They want you to do the, uh, the initial uh, design of the course, etc. And they then want to be able to make modifications themselves. And obviously, yeah. you know, to make those modifications, they need to have uh, a copy of Captivate. And, and the same is true with, with um, Articulate as well, for that matter. And so I think that uh, sometimes what the client has internally in their organization can also help drive which tool um, you end up by using. But I definitely agree with you, Rick, that you know having competition is a really important thing um, because that way we can go to our favorite software vendors and say, you know, we really want to be able to do this, and it's in this other tool, and why can't we have it in in you know your tool? Right. And uh, mm-hmm. making sure that they're they're still pushing the boundaries as far as possible. I mean, for example, I know with Adobe Captivate that you can do an awful lot now thanks to the new functionality that's available with um, uh, the improvements to advanced actions, and uh, you can really start to build some very powerful uh, soft skills based uh, simulations now with inside Adobe Captivate and. And uh, one of the things I would like to see in the future is just simplifying that whole process. Because again, with rapid e-learning development, you want to make sure that you're turning your courses around in two or three weeks, not you know three or six months. And so there's uh, there's always room for improvement with all the uh, the tools. From your mouth to Shamir's ears. <laughs> yeah, that's Hopefully the one. I heard that comment. <laughs> I, I ping him on a, re, a regular basis saying, come on now, you know, when can we have this? And, and I leave her and, uh, and others do as well. So uh, he, he actually, we're, we're, we're hot on that tail. <laughs> he actually spent a week in our offices a little, little under a year and a half ago, and we implanted him. So he gets secret messages every night saying, add this feature. Add Fantastic. Feature. Subliminal <laughs> messaging. Fantastic. He, he doesn't know that. He's probably not watching right now, but yes, add those features quick. I had those features. <laughs> he'll, he'll watch the recording, though. I think he's sleeping right now. I, probably. I think it's a bedtime <laughs> over there. Is. Yeah, definitely. That's actually pretty late your time, too, isn't it? You're about 10 It's o'clock? about uh, 6.30 now, my time. Oh, so it's not too bad. Oh, you're not nine hours. Bad. I think you're nine hours away from us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah definitely. I think Shamir was 13, 13 and a half. So it's, uh, it's quite a few hours more. And uh, RJ had made a couple of comments. Actually, there's several comments throughout the uh, the chat room there about uh, uh, agreeing with the, the the competition statement that everybody seems to appreciate that that there is competition amongst the e, e the authoring tool designers. So, and coming from an authoring tool designer like RJ, that's good to that's good to see. Well, it is good. It's good for all of us because yeah. the more we have options the more it forces the companies to come up with better options. And, and you know, we can only benefit from that. If you look at what, what's happened with Captivate, if you look at a little bit of the history, it was developed originally by a person in Australia, a one-man show, and then from there it got acquired by eHelp. They did quite a good job of cleaning things up and making it better. Then it got acquired by Macromedia, which kind of dropped the ball on it and didn't quite do that well with it. Then it got acquired by Adobe, and um, there were a couple of so-so releases, and then finally with four, and now with five, it's really come on to to its own as a very good product. Uh, Previous (laughs) versions were buggy. We couldn't use it before for large projects, only very simple, small ones. But now, uh, we can use it for just about anything. 
And uh, that's that's a testament to the work of the engineering group and and the amount of effort that they've put into it over these last three, four years to make it a very viable and good product and, and leading product in a lot of ways. Yeah. yeah, I think that's true. And I think something else that's fair to say as well is the fact that because now we have the Adobe Learning Suite, uh, we're now able to take advantage of a lot of the great functionality that's available in some of those other products as well. I mean, I think one of the things that really struck me when I first started in doing this type of work was the fact that, gosh, you know, without some Flash skills, without some Photoshop skills, etc., I was really going to struggle. And because obviously I came from a web development background, I already had some of those skills implanted in my brain as it were and so to see now the way in which they're really starting to get to to grips with the whole idea of integration you know it's impossible to put everything with inside a single product I do think one of the strengths of the learning suite is obviously that strong level of integration now that we have with Photoshop and, and Flash and I think Shamir and the team did a great job in, uh, in ELS2, eLearning Suite 2, to make sure that that level of integration was taken to, uh, to the next level, as it were. So I think they've done a, uh, a really good job there. There's just lots, other, lots of other things I would like to see them uh, to, uh, add into uh, the next version. Because, again, I, I think you know, from, a, from a rapid e-learning standpoint, especially if you're you know, a single developer, then you need to have some of the uh, the skills that are uh, required in uh, in many other disciplines as you know single entities so if you were doing you know gaming design and you were using flash then that's the only thing that you'd probably end up by doing and you'd have a graphic designer would do all your graphic design work um but obviously, if you're just a one-man band like I am, then you've got to have uh, additional skills as well. And uh, sometimes just keeping up with things can be uh, wearing, to say the least, but definitely worthwhile. And uh, thankfully, the programs, I think, anyway, are becoming much easier to use. And I cut my teeth with Photoshop on Photoshop 2.5. And just to see the way in which that program has uh, improved over the years has been phenomenal, to and, be honest with you. And you remember in those days, you needed graphic acceleration cards to make it work well. Oh, yeah, $1, definitely. $1,000 graphic acceleration cards. The good old days. Yeah, definitely. I changed. remember um, being involved with one particular project for a very large serial company, and uh, they got their very high spec Mac, etc. And they were tempted to place a security guard next to it because it was that expensive. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's amazing to see just how much all this stuff's come down in price, and uh, just Apple how much more accessible it is. I thought that was an Apple requirement back then. <laughs> it probably was actually at one stage. <laughs> yeah. You shall have a security guard. See, you get one shall. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Maybe we could now turn them into an SME. <laughs> <laughs> but it looks like we have our, our first uh, um, guest from uh, Taiwan. Uh, I don't think we've had any, uh, any viewers from Taiwan, but um, WDEVN. And please, by all means, at least tell me your, your first name. But uh, it looks like he's calling from or chatting in the chat room from, from Taiwan. So we are, uh, we're reaching all, all points of the globe on this episode. And Shishani for joining us. That's thank uh, you. It took Chinese years ago. I don't remember it too well. James is his name. Okay, he just replied back. So welcome, James. Thanks for joining us. And he's a uh, he's been a great contributor in the in the chat room. So thanks so much. And and of course our regulars too. You got Dawn and Jeff and RJ. Um, uh, who else do we have in here? That's uh, uh, Lily. So uh, Dave uh, Landy, Dave also. So it's great seeing uh, a lot of the regulars in here. And welcome to the new folks. That's true. That's great. And thank you all for showing up to this. And we are really coming close to the end of our about 45 minutes here with Mark. Mark, before we sign off, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about your voiceover work. Um, you have a great voice. You've got that natural English accent, which we all try to have, but it just doesn't sound as good. Uh, <laughs> I'm available for work, Rick, if you're looking for anyone. <laughs> uh, we, we, we always keep you in mind. Actually, we have presented you on a couple of occasions, but at that point, they wanted, for some odd reason, an American voice. But um, no, you have a very good voice, and uh, I remember listening to a lot of your training, not, not only with the VTC days, but when you were with um, WebAssist, and um, I thought you really 
gave a good message and your voice is, is good. It carries the, the training, whatever you do well. Um, what kind of voiceover work do you do? Well, predominantly, I do e-learning, to be honest with you. I have tried to break into some of the other ground, but it's uh, it's pretty difficult um, over here anyway to um, uh, to get into uh, the other styles of, uh, of voiceover work. And I really enjoy the e-learning work as well, because obviously it's something that I'm very passionate about.